Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our presentation, Building a Customer Experience Strategy, The Essentials, presented by PhD Melissa Baker, an associate professor in the Department of Hospitality and Tourism Management at the Eisenberg School of Management at the University of Massachusetts Amherst in collaboration with Ivy Exact. My name is Mariana. I'm on the higher education team here at Ivy Exact, and I'll be helping to moderate today's session. Before we begin, I have a few brief housekeeping items for our audience. First, all attendees are currently in listen-only mode. However, we do encourage you to engage in the session by asking questions to our presenter, which you can do using the question box in your GoToWebinar control panel. We will also have a formal Q&A session during the last 15 minutes of the webinar. Additionally, we are recording today's session, so you can look forward to receiving a copy of the recording via email in the coming days. And now, I would like to introduce you to PhD Tracy J. Hess, Associate Dean for Graduate and Professional Programs and Berthium Endowed Professor of Information Systems at Eisenberg School of Management. Thank you. Um, so yes, my name is Tracy Hess, and I am the Associate Dean for Graduate Programs in the Eisenberg School. It's my pleasure to be with you today and to introduce our guest speaker. But before I do so, I'd like to share a little bit about UMass Amherst and the Eisenberg School of Management. Uh, next, please. Feel free. Um, so UMass Amherst is the flagship campus of the UMass Amherst system and is located in the beautiful college town of Amherst, mm -hmm. Massachusetts. It was founded in 1963 and is the largest public university in New England. The university consistently ranks highly in many different rankings and is currently ranked 26 among a very competitive field of national public institutions. Now the Eisenberg School of Management is one of the gems of the UMass campus, UMass Amherst campus. We're accredited by the ACSB and we have over 3,900 undergraduate students and about 2,000 graduate students. We offer a range of different master's programs, whether you are looking to continue your career while, while pursuing your graduate education goals, or whether you're looking to go back to school as a full-time student, we have a program to fit your needs. Flexibility is a key offering for us with a variety of master's programs, including our highly ranked MBA program or one of our specialized master's programs. So for those of you looking to pursue a degree while continuing in your professional career, our MBA, MSBA, and our MSA programs are also offered online and get, can be pursued part-time. Um, you can also test the waters with the certificate online and then transition to one of our degree programs. Next. So we have been a leader in online education for over 20 years. Our first online offering was our MBA program, and it follows the same curriculum and includes the same faculty as our on-campus full-time MBA program. The online MBA program is ranked highly across a number of different ranking organizations, including 26 among 295 online MBA programs ranked by U.S. News. This particular program offers the ultimate in flexibility for our students as they can complete the program in as little as two years, or they can take the coursework at a more modest pace. Our students can also pursue a number of focus areas as listed there on our slide, and we can also tailor the focus areas for our students. Uh, next. And now it gives us, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Melissa Baker. She's an associate professor in our hospitality and tourism management department. Um, she received her BS from Cornell University, her MS, and her PhD from Virginia Tech, also my alma mater. And she's a renowned scholar on customer experience management, service failure and recovery, and impression formation. She has over 75 top tier journal and conference publications. She's a winner of the University Wide Distinguished Teaching Award, our College Wide Teaching Award, and a Lilly Teaching Fellow. Again, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Melissa Baker. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Very excited to be here to be talking about building a customer experience strategy. We're going to be talking about the essentials here today. So what we're mostly going to be focusing on is why customer experience management, why this is so important. And, and as you can see here, through a lot of our infographics, 86% of customers are willing to pay more for a better customer experience. 
within that, we're going to be giving you some actionable strategies to be able to do this a little more effectively in terms of why it is so important to very clearly define your unique brand experience for your type of business. We'll be talking about the importance of both virtual and online experiences. We often think of a very brick and mortar perspective that only when people are in your store, but going through those virtual, those app experiences, online experiences can be just as beneficial or as harmful to your brands. We'll be talking about the importance of mapping the entire customer experience journey and all of those multiple touch points with which your customers can either form a positive a neutral or a negative impression. And then we'll be talking about the importance of tracking our data, our customer experience data and data analytics. As we go, if anyone has any questions, of course, you can send that to our moderator, but we will also have time for questions and answers at the end. So why focus on customer experience management? We have here information, uh, the top business priority within the next five years is customer experience management. Almost half of firms are saying of every priority there possibly is, that that is the most important one that they have. So if you are not focusing on this, your competitors or 45% of your competitors are. We'll look at a few of statistics that are coming here. Companies right now, think about this and how staggering some of these statistics are. U.S. companies lose more than $62 billion a year due to poor customer service. Seven out of 10 U.S. customers say they've spent more money with a business that will deliver better service. The amount of money that we increase in terms of our revenue from our businesses. 5% of customer retention rates will increase your business profits from 25 to 95%. When we lose a customer due to poor service experience, it is anywhere from five to 25 times more expensive to get a new customer to your business than it is to keep those current ones. When we talk about our customer experiences, if our customers have a poor experience, they're on average gonna tell 15 people, whether that's in person or also through the very dangerous electronic word of mouth and social media, 11 people will spread that positive word of mouth about a good experience. 51% of customers say that after just one negative experience, they will never come back to a company again. And 71% of customers are likely to switch if they find purchasing difficult. So when we look at all of these statistics, we hopefully are looking at how important this overall topic is. Also, according to Harvard Business Review, we look at both membership, so whether that is people um, buying member, different types of membership services or people that have ongoing membership like in a bank, the predicted increase we have in membership as we improve our customer experience, and then also in transaction-based sales. So sales are driven again by that good customer experience. So you can see how much revenue increase we have as we go from say a customer experience score of seven or eight to a nine or a 10. And most experiences here fall short. You can see here that the level of importance in terms of what we are expecting from our experiences, our customers are expecting, this is research done by uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers, versus their actual level of satisfaction. And there's a pretty sizable gap here. Airlines are very notorious for people wanting a certain level of experience in airlines and airlines often being very much lower in the level of satisfaction. But for all of our participants here, this occurs across such a wide range of different types of industries. In healthcare, retail, pharma, banking, investments, insurance, software, food service, technology, you can see here that what customers want and then their actual level of satisfaction is a huge gap. And there's also a large gap in terms of what management and what leadership thinks they're delivering versus what customers actually feel they are getting. Most firms think their customers are satisfied. In fact, the data usually says that firms think they're delivering high quality products at about 80 or 90%. And most customers are saying they're often dissatisfied at about 80 or 90%. So there's also a gap in that listening between our management and our actual customers. And so 
how do we lessen that gap so that we're able to make our customers more satisfied and the first important critical thing that we are learning the first essential is how do we define our specific brand experience so we're going to have our first poll here for our participants but overall for customers what do people value most in a brand experience do you think they value most efficiency convenience friendly service, atmosphere, or that human interaction? Thank you, Melissa. Um, the poll is up and running. We're going to give our audience 20 more seconds to, to answer, and then we'll wrap it up. Two more seconds. I think vast majority of our audience already voted. So we're gonna wrap up the poll now and I'll let you know what the results are. So 17% efficiency, 26% convenience, same for friendly service, 3% atmosphere, and 29% human interaction. All right, so yeah, so I mean, I think that's really interesting results there that we had a lot of individuals say convenience, friendliness, and that human components with our services are going to be the ones that we thought were most important, right? And you may see that uh, that efficiency and convenience here, according to our PwC experience survey, also ranked as some of the most important. And we can see here both as level of importance for consumer, but also whether your consumers are willing to pay more for these different elements. For an efficient service, time is very precious. You know, we all only have 24 hours in every day. So efficiency and convenience are incredibly important to our customers and that friendly service, that human element, and then as you predicted, maybe the, the atmosphere and the atmospherics a little bit lower, maybe some of the design, social responsibility, up-to-date technology. But here's the thing, it, it actually really depends and that's why it is so critical to define your service experience. What are you trying to deliver and who is your target customer? What is the targeted brand experience that you are trying to deliver for your business how do you design that atmosphere to best deliver that? So if we use a, a hotel example, we see here a courtyard by Marriott, a very popular chain hotel. Now, if we're going to a courtyard by Marriott, we have to think about, right, who is that target customer? They probably want something that is consistent. We do want that convenience. We want a brand that we know, and we're looking for a medium quality experience we were looking for friendly staff but we're not looking for the most customizable individualized we're not looking for the highest level of amenities we're looking for just a good basic hotel experience but if we're ritz carlton which at the end of the day is still selling the same product right it's this, it's a hotel night stay but those customers that targeted customers looking for a very different experience we want the luxury the personalization the high-end thread count on our sheets, beautiful fresh flowers, all of those things, and the customers who go there, the price we're willing to pay is very different, even though same products, a hotel night. What about this? I'm not sure if we've heard of the pod hotels, very popular in some airports, particularly in parts of Asia, as well as very popular in Asia. Now, very different customer. For this, we're not looking for an entire room and a separate chair and a little place for a desk. We're looking for a tiny little pot, a place to store our stuff, and a tiny little space that we're able to sleep in. If you have a layover, an eight hour layover in an airport, how many times have we all wished, I wish I could just crawl in a little space and get some sleep? Super popular, but obviously this has a market that we wouldn't necessarily put in the middle of a beautiful travel destination, that's not where I wanna stay. So we also have the same thing you know, across different brand experiences. If you look at things like retail, the customer that shops at a Forever 21, how we target that brand experience, the qualities, the trendiness, 
that we focus on is very different than what we might do for a Nordstrom or even for say Chanel. So that's why it's really important to think about what is of all of these characteristics we have here, what is important for your brand experience? Because yes, it might be friendliness or efficiency, but if you are a unique destination, you want that atmosphere that will actually be the most important for you. So within that, it's very important. And if you haven't done this in a while, customer preferences are changing, particularly in a post COVID-19 world. What customers are looking for is different than what they maybe were looking for a year ago. So you may want to revisit as a team what are who is our customer what are they looking for both in terms of our key demographic variables really important here with our psychographic variables the customer who shops at chanel might be very different than the customer who shops at an ll bean in terms of their attitude their lifestyle their personality right the customer who drives a porsche is very different than the customer who drives a jeep also in terms of if we are a global business if there are differences between localness Having things be local is very popular, national, inter, international as well. So revisit those things and really go back to the core of what your business is. Who is your customer? What are they looking for? And has that changed in a post COVID-19 world? Also think about in terms of some of our demographics, really interesting, Gen Z is becoming one of the most popular buying, purchasing powers that we have. And what they're looking for is with maybe more with our mobile experiences. They want things that have more of a fun, uh, more of an interesting design element. And then when we also look at from a global perspective, what different customers are looking for, you can see here that customer experience and how much more that is important when it comes to different purchasing decisions does vary based on different customer demographics, where they are, where they are from. And of course, that doesn't mean it's a one size fits all. We have a lot of individuality and diversity, but you know, if we are in certain locations, how much the customer experience significantly matters to some groups um, while it matters quite a bit to others. And within that, you know, this is a great model of how to do that. Um, this is from Deloitte LRA, which is one of the leading consultants in customer experience management. But really for all of you to think about how do you recognize value and how do you give value for your brand? Again, the Pod Hotel offers a ton of value to the right customer that doesn't need a large hotel room and just wants a little place to put their stuff and a place to sleep and doesn't really need much else. But there's also a ton of value to be staying at a beautiful, one-of-a-kind, gorgeous destination. Know your customers. We're gonna talk about tracking and enhancing that value creation. But again, it all starts with being able to define your customer and your experience. Next thing we are gonna look at here is our virtual and online experiences. Again, very important, but in a post COVID-19 world, virtual and online experiences have absolutely expanded. So we're gonna move here to our second poll with what frustrates customers most with their online experiences. Do customers get most frustrated with our website in general, the difficulty of actually navigating our site, poor design, speed or a slow website or when we have issues inability to reach an actual human or reach out to an actual customer service agents thank you so much professor baker um the poll is now active and i think almost half of the audience already get the chance to vote so we're going to wait for a few more seconds until we wrap it up Okay, great. And we're just about to close the poll now. And the results are as follows. So 13% frustrating website, 24% difficulty navigating web page, 14% poor site design, same for slow website, and then 34% inability to reach customer service agents. 
Look at that inability. So, I mean, even though we talk about how important, right, virtual and online experiences are, I love that that 34% of you thought inability to reach an actual human when we want to. Um, you know, we the, the word um, Comcast has become fairly, and I hope no one works for Comcast, I apologize. Um, I think they're working on getting better, but there's been some, you know, Comcast has been known to, to be have some poor customer service. And a lot of that is that automation that we really just wanna to get to that customer service agent. Uber, notoriously a number of years ago, was if you had an issue, not just with your actual uh, reaching, you know, th there was one with your actual ride share, but if you had an issue, and this happened to me where my account apparently was hacked and I had thousands of dollars of charges, on my account and the only way to talk, reach to anyone was to send an email and they said we'll get back to you in in 24 to 72 hours as my account is continually racking up charges so very frustrating they have since i think added some places where you can talk to maybe a human a little bit but very interesting and then also that difficulty navigating that site is also super important so these virtual experiences, yes, it's your online site, but also for many of you, those mobile apps, people are increasingly using all different kinds of mobile apps, but also that increase in virtual experiences that we have and virtual meetings and virtual things like interviews. How many of us are going to continue to keep Zoom or Google Teams or whatever site that you use to do your virtual meetings, meet with potential clients, meet with potential candidates. Um, these virtual experiences are really, really important in terms of how we, again, assess that firm, whether we're willing to keep purchasing, spread positive word of mouth, our satisfaction level. And you can see here some statistics again, you know, that a frustrating online experience really hurts your overall opinion or a bad mobile experience that 55% of our customers talk about that. And 52% say that I'm disappointed if I have a bad experience on a mobile site. So it may also be time to not just think about our physical inside of our, whether we have, you know, doctor's offices, retail space, hospitality, tourism sites, but the virtual experience as well. And UMass, right? So we write on our website, take a virtual tour of UMass anywhere on any device. And how effective is that virtual tour and what people are able to do as well as navigating our website to the viewpoint of that, how we view UMass as a brand. You know, we talk about our virtual meeting spaces on Zoom, all of those things, what people are wearing, what our backgrounds are like, the sound, the spacing that we're in, all of those things are really going to affect the effectiveness of that experience meeting with potential clients or customers. Our online mobile apps, here we have one as an example from Bank of America, but how useful those are able to be. And then, you know, are we also going into the space of virtual experiences, whether it is virtual tours like UMass has, virtual hotel tours as an example, and Airbnb experiences, if you have not, you should check this out. They are leading the way here, and this has seen a boom and has continued to be incredibly successful in that going to Iceland and seeing the Aurora Borealis or going on the Harry Potter tour in London is great if I'm able to go to Iceland or London, but for $21, can I also do these online virtual tours and these experiences and making pasta with a Nona from Italy, can we do that virtually? And it adds again, a lot of value to our brand. And that's something that Airbnb has done um, and they're starting to carve out a, a really profitable niche for themselves with these virtual experiences. So think about that as well. That then leads us into how do we map that customer experience journey, both with mapping that entire journey in our physical spaces, but also mapping that entire journey with our virtual and online experiences. You know, we had 24% of us said navigating the online site is really frustrating. Well, what part of that journey causes us to become most frustrated and not want to purchase from that brand? So we have our next poll here, which is when do customers or when do you stop interacting with your brand? Do you do it after just one bad experiences? Do you give them a little bit more of a chance and have two to three bad experiences? 
Do you stop buying from your brand after four or more experiences, or are you that customer that says, I stay loyal to a brand no matter what? Perfect. Thank you so much, Professor Baker. Um, we're already live with the poll. Um, and again, the vast majority of our uh, attendees voted, so we're just going to give them 15 more seconds before we close it. Okay, perfect. So we're going to close the poll now. And here we go. 28% after one bad experience, 68 after two to three bad experiences, 3% after four, and only 1% stay loyal no matter what. Team, what a tough audience we are. My goodness, look, 20, was it 28% of you? One, think about this, one yeah. bad experience is, and you're done. One. And every and mostly everybody else, another 68% says that after just what two or three experiences we, we we're done so think about how quickly you are losing your customers and again it is five to 25 times more expensive to gain a new customer than it is to keep your existing ones but all that it takes is one two or three bad experiences and your customer is done and leaving you and what's then really tricky is that think about all of those different points and this is a, a little bit of a different um from pwc from their survey but again really high amount between one bad experience different countries when we are leaving so this is why it is so critical that we map that journey at what point during that entire complex journey and those service experiences are complex when are those customers leaving are they leaving right when they get to the site because we don't have a clear map? Are they leaving when they have poor customer, you know, the, the, the agent isn't friendly? Are they leaving because things are taking too long and services slow? Are we leaving right before we purchase because you're making the purchasing very difficult? Right at what point, and that's why we need to map all of those elements of your experience. If you have not done that in a while, I would highly encourage that you and your team go back and revisit because we're so ingrained in our business that we almost forget all of those little touch points, and every single touch point can lead to a positive or a negative evaluation, which is a touch point at which a customer can have a great or a poor experience and leave. That's also why it's really important that we look at service recovery. When something bad happens, how do we recover? How do we fix it? Through our communication with our customers, through being able to provide them with a new product or be able to compensate them in some way. How do we deal with both those live and those online customer complaints? For many companies, look at this, look at the statistic. So many of our customers, we think that the absence of negative feedback, a customer complaining to us or a customer posting online through social media, through an online channel, means that our customers were satisfied. But the vast majority of our customers, and think about how you behave when you aren't happy, do you say something or you just say, I'm done with this firm and I am never coming back? So that might not be the case. You want to make sure that we keep our customers as much as we can. And again, we map in the part of that journey where we're losing our customers, right? Because we want to find those critical points and make sure we are delivering. It's tough too, because customers are tough. Customer expectations are at an all time high. Um, and that's why it's even more important with that expectation reality gap that we're able to get to all of our customers. You look at something here like a, a hotel stay, this entire journey, think about all of these touch points. We have to think about how we get that person interested in our marketing materials, how we're reaching them, whether it's through pop-ups, whether it's through targeted marketing, word of mouth, that customer then doing all of this research on your website, are they going and doing a virtual tour? Are they looking at things on social media? Then are they have to go through that journey of actually booking? How are they doing that? Are they going through your website? Are they going through a third party sites like an Expedia um, or a Kayak? 
Are they then once they're on the property and think about all of those multiple touch points we have from driving in, checking in, checking your baggage, getting to your hotel room, all of the pieces of your hotel room. Are we using the spa, the in-room dining, the restaurants, the bars, parking, all of those different things where we have the option of creating a positive moment of truth, right? Or a negative moment of truth where the customer firms a positive or negative impression. And then afterwards, when they leave, do we post a review? Are you commenting on those positive reviews or those positive social media posts? Are you not saying anything? Are you following up with those customers? All of those pieces of that journey. If we look at something like retail, right? Same thing. I mean, we have all of these things and how we get people to decide I need to make a purchase, how they're researching all of those touch points of parking, walking into a store, the displays, navigating the store, the way that the products are, are they able to find the product they want, the different sizes, interacting with the different service personnel, using that products, are they able to call and get support if they have issues, do they want to make a repeat purchase? So very complex, map those pieces of that journey because likely what you will find is there are bottlenecks there are pieces where you can improve your journey where you're causing that dis dissatisfaction moments where you're losing that significant amount of our customers and this again is a great infographic to also think about how we tie in mapping that customer experience journey to tracking a lot of that data how are we looking at customer's behavior, the transient nature of their behavior, and convert that into loyal customers or high purchasing intentions. So different ways that we're able to do that, are we measuring their sentiments, emotions that we have, are we tracking things with our web and mobile apps and our sites, are we using mystery shops or consulting or on-site field inspections, so different ways that we're really able to look at all of those touch points and mapping that journey. And that leads us into our last point, which is tracking our data and making sure that we are getting that data. Data is the most useful thing that we have. So we're gonna have our last poll here, but what really drives people away from our service? Is it a poor employee attitude? Is it inconsistency? So sometimes we have a great experience, other times we have a poor experience. Is it that poor service design? So it's a frustrating design of that environment. Inefficiency or lack of trust. We don't trust that brands. So we'll have our last poll open now. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Baker. So um, we're almost halfway through with the with the responses. Um, we're gonna give 10 to 15 seconds before we close the poll. Okay, great. We are about to close the poll now. And here we go. 25% poor employee attitude, 12% inconsistency, 14% poor service design, 13% inefficiency, and 36% lack of trust. Excellent. Very interesting results there, right? So we look at in, in our group here, the trust. Do we trust that brand? 36% um, of us think that, that trusting a brand and, and whatever brand that is, you know, if I purchase from this brand, I'm going to tend to have a good service. I can trust the product. I It's a really super important thing. And that, again, that data of trust being such an important element is something that we want to maybe look at. How can we focus on that more? And poor employee attitude, 25% of us says it still relates to our employees. Are we hiring the right people? Are we training them? Are we paying them? Um, it's hard right now to get good people and we want to make sure that we are competing compensating our employees, making sure that we're creating the right culture and environment because poor employee attitude, again, one to three experiences and most of us are leaving. You can see here, this is from the PwC. Um, they found that poor employee attitude was the most important 
Um, but also, you know, some of these other components, I think trust is really important. It wasn't on their survey. You agreed that we thought this was important as well. But you can see both in the U.S. and across all countries. Oh, so I apologize. Untrusted company was their number three. But you can see how important these things are in terms of the experience. And collect that data. See what is most important for your customers. Again, based on your firm, your experience, the type of industry that you're in, it's going to be a little bit different. You know, diff we will focus on different elements. So it isn't necessarily all a one size fits all model. You can see here that also in a post COVID 19 world, other things that we are looking for, some places are looking for a lot more innovation and a lot more incorporation of technology, but not always. I think one of the things that we have seen in the last year and a half when we haven't really been able to go to restaurants and go to events and weddings and travel because of a lot of restrictions, I think people are really hungry for this human interaction and this higher level of service. So don't negate that huge boom that's going to happen as well but also that we also want the options of being able to do things online in efficiency like our mobile ordering when we look here right think of all of the different ways through all of the different aspects of the customer journey the pre-purchase purchase and post-purchase stages different ways that we're able to target our marketing materials but also potentially get data and track our data so that we're targeting the right types of customers. Um, direct mail or email is gonna work for different types of customers. The customers that are going to be very social media savvy are gonna be different than the ones that maybe want other types of marketing like advertisements. The way that our different customers are purchasing, has there been a shift in the last two years in the ways that your customers are purchasing? And post-purchase behavior. There is a ton of valuable data to collect through loyalty programs, through surveys, through offering incentives to your customers. Use that data, right? And most often what we're collecting is really basic data, but look deep, more deeply into your customer behavior. Disney is a great example of this, and I know that they spent a billion dollars on their Disney magic bands. But to make it easier for customers to a certain extent, you can get the Disney Magic Band and it tracks all of your behavior. It tracks where you're going, your traffic flow, the time that you're spending in different places, the purchasing behavior that you have in the restaurants and hotels. And you can make everything simple by just tapping your Magic Band at your hotel, at all of your purchases, retail, food and beverage. But Disney has all of that data now on all of their customer behavior and that value is so important in terms of redesigning their service experience for their customers and that's of course a very extreme example but what we really want to do is figure out hey we're able to do this more effectively integrate your data include those key performance indicators customer satisfaction metrics external data web scrape for your social media Find a way to report and have our data analytics here, make it usable to your management team so that your management is then able to make decisions and actions based on all of this data. And this ties in everything that we've been talking about, really making sure that we look at both our virtual and online experiences, making sure that we really identify what our brand experience should be, mapping that customer journey, but then using and collecting that data. If you're not collecting that data, you're only going off of what you think versus what that customer data actually shows. So here's a few takeaways for you on how we're able to do that. Of course, you as a firm can independently look at collecting your own surveys or looking at your customer relationship or your loyalty program data. Getting that, we also um, certainly um, here, I'm happy to assist or answer other questions on how we're able to divine. Uh, design simple surveys to do this. Google Analytics can be a really simple tool. Regular Google Analytics is free. Google Anix, Analytics 360 is for slightly larger firms, but it will help you to be able to analyze some of that data that you have. Amplitude is another great site where you're able to actually look at that data that you have with your customers or talk to you about how to collect that data a little bit more effectively. And Deloitte LRA, 
which is the most respected uh, consultants on, and these LRA specifically focuses on customer experience management. Um, and you can see here a snapshot from their website, a lot of the things that we have talked about here, but you can also look to consultants about how to look at the customer experience journey, help you analyze your data so that you're able to have a much more effective, stronger customer experience, which we want to lead into more profits, happier customers, more customers for all of our attendees. So with that, we're happy to turn it over to some questions uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions that we have at this time. Hey, thank you so much, Dr. Baker. This was really helpful. Uh, we do have a, a couple of questions that came through during the presentation, so I'll, I'll start with the first one. Um, do you maybe have any suggestions on how uh, we can create a comprehensive customer journey map? Yeah, you know, I, I think this, you know, again, you can use some of the, you know, consulting organizations if you want, but one of the things is, is I would just create a team or, or a small team of individuals and walk through your own customer experience journey and, and map out every single piece. Again, I mean, if we think about you're going into your operation, start from the pre-purchase, how they find you, what does your website look like, are, you know, what is your search engine optimization, but then walk through your physical space as well. What does everything look like? Is it easy to navigate? Is your signage clear? Are your employees friendly? So just do a very simple walkthrough and create a really comprehensive map of what that is. And then one of the things that you can do from there is, again, whether you hire an outside consultant firm or you use, say, mystery shop services, where you will have um, customers walk through that journey and go ahead and evaluate you on all of those things that you have identified as key pieces to that experience journey. But Start with a simple walkthrough, and I think you'll find that when you take a step back and just say, oh, that's actually hard to get to, or that isn't clear, or we don't have anybody at this area and we should, I think you'll start to see some of those, those places. Does that, hopefully that helps answer your question, but walk through it and write everything down and track all of those things. And then from there, you can pair back, this is maybe less or more important, or these are the elements that we want to focus on. Wonderful. And we do have a follow-up question on this one actually coming from Robert. And what would we use as a benchmark in this case? That's, yeah, that is that is a great question. I think that you can certainly attempt to get some statistics and find some statistics as benchmarks. Again, if you use a company, they may be able to have um, some other benchmarks, um, such as a, a consulting firm that will help you be able to gauge. But you can always benchmark against yourself right and be able to get some of those benchmarks collect some basic surveys or collect um, look at your customer relationship management your databases your loyalty databases and see where you start and then as you invest in an improvement do you then see the return on that investment as well i would also recommend that the american customer satisfaction index um, the acsi is a great site as well that has some overall benchmarks for pretty much every industry that you can imagine and you can see where they are tracking for example airlines tend to uh, rate pretty low overall in satisfaction but that's a great resource for you as well if you're not able to find some or you're in a smaller firm and uh, can't have a consultant but also measure your own benchmarks so hopefully just, uh, robert does that help out I, th I think this answers the question. We'll, we'll hear from Robert uh, if anything new comes uh, comes up. But um, here's another one. What are your thoughts about the validity of NPS ratings? Um, so I think that as as with everything, I I think that it depends um, a little bit. So I think any time that we can have information or different types of ratings, it it will help. But I think that also we need to make sure that, that we do our work and, and investigate that, that data thoroughly because it, it really does, there, there is a lot of depending um, in there. Got it. Thank you so much, Dr. Baker. Here's our next question. Um, in your opinion, what is more important, customer service or customer experience? So there, that's a great question. Um, 
Customer service is sort of the overall arching kind of topic and customer experience really relates to the journey or the experience with it. So, so they're very, very similar and, and they are very much aligned. I think customer service is the overall umbrella, but more, you know, service really, the, the experience is really what's becoming much more focused on and, and much more popular and particularly the experience journey um, is, is really a key focus of most businesses. And so I, I would say they're both important, but that the experience is becoming a key element at this moment. Perfect, thank you. Um, we have another interesting question. Why does it seem that customers are far more likely to complain online versus share positive feedback? Yeah, great question. Um, so I think I think there's 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 a couple pieces here. Uh, you know, the first one is is that things that are negative tend to affect us more significantly than things that are positive, right? When we have when something negative happens to us we ruminate, we get angry, our negative emotions are much more impactful. And then so from those emotions and those attitudes that are stronger with negativity than they are with positive, that then it compels us to have an action. And it happens with service, but it also happens just generally in life, right? Negative reactions tend to be stronger, last longer, and impel, uh, compel us to actions more than positive. The other thing, and when your customers give you negative feedback or complain, it isn't a bad thing, right? What's bad is when your customers have a negative reaction and they say nothing. Because most of us, as we looked at, I think it was over 90% of us said with one to three bad interactions, we're never coming back. So if your customer complains, either in person or online, you have an opportunity to fix it. If you give a positive recovery, if you can figure out what that customer is looking for, and different customers are looking for different things in that recovery. Some people wanna show, um, they want you to apologize, they want you to be empathetic with what happened, and they really wanna show that focus on that relationship. Some customers want some type of compensation, right? And maybe that's a 10% discount, maybe that's, uh, we're gonna, Give you a new product that product you were unsatisfied with will ship a new one to you some customers you might be able to win them back with a future service so if they had a poor experience at your establishment come back and the next visit is on us right but if we're able to do that it's not bad when they complain because you can fix it if they never complain there's never anything that we can do. And it's also, you know, some customers will come, it's better if customers complain in person because it's easier to fix in person. Read their body language. Look at what the, you know, look at the tone that they are, listen to the tone that they have. Listen to the words that they are using. Are we able to fix what they want? Um, social media or online platforms, it's still an opportunity to fix it. You can't fix it right there, but you can offer a future service or try and entice them to give you another chance. And oftentimes, if you have a really effective recovery, right? So someone complains, we solve their problem, those customers actually will give you another chance. And if you do it correctly, a lot of times those customers will then become those more loyal lifelong customers for you. It's a great topic. Thing. It is, that is, yeah, that is such an upset. That is, it's one of my research areas. I am happy to talk about that in depth on on different ways we're able to do great um, investigate service failures and recoveries. But it it is also a very critical topic, and and there's some great information out there from from a lot of sources to how to do that. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm 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 pretty sure that you know our attendees can follow up with you um, after the webinar to. Um, to address these additionally, but we have um, more interesting questions coming through. So um, there are several companies out there like the Container Store that believe if you focus completely on employee experience, you never need to worry about the customer as the staff will do that. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I think that I think that is great advice. Yeah, and and if you take care of your employees, you hire employees that have the right attitude, that hire that have the right motivation. 
you train them into what your brand means, you make sure that all of those things align and you treat your employees really well, those employees are gonna work hard. They're gonna wanna deliver great service. So absolutely, it very much starts with employees, your leadership employees, but also the employees that you hire in terms of delivering that experience because that is a major touch point is that employee interaction we have with high intensive service industries. So real really important it, it that is absolutely part of the uh the layer of customer service right is having the right people to lead to giving the right service that then leads to the customer be, the desirable customer behaviors great question thank you dr baker um here's another one in the beginning it has really shown that the u.s companies are losing customers because of poor customer service as well as 62 million are lost annually so how can you measure such kind of loss? And what are the possible measures that might allow the companies to refrain from losing that amount of money on an annual level? Right, so this is, this is where tracking our data um, becomes very important. And so if you're able to, if you have information and databases on your customers, and you can see that a customer had purchasing for five years, and then in the last two years has not purchased from you, Right, there's some attrition there, whether it's just decreased purchasing or they've completely stopped coming to you. So I would investigate that data. Do you want to try and re reach out to that customer? But look at that information, collect that data in terms of purchasing power, reward customers, customer databases that you have. Look at all of that and see where you're losing your customers. Is it specific instances where you're losing them? Are they going to different types of competitors? But that's exactly what we're talking about is start digging into that data and see what that information is telling you. Perfect, thank you. Here's another interesting question for you. How high would you rate psychographics analysis in this customer process? Hi, hi. You know, one of the big things is that we, most firms tend to focus on just demographics. And that's what we're collecting from our customers, right? We're, but we're missing a lot of those lifestyle, right? And those psychographic things. And, and again, the example, the type of customer that goes to an REI or an LL Bean, they're looking for outdoorsy adventure, right? That's a very different customer. Can't not, it may be the same customer, but someone that maybe goes to a Gucci, right? So you want to make sure that you think about, and, and it's in absolutely everything, right? The, the lifestyle, the person that's shopping at an Ikea, it might be very different than the person that's, look, that's going vintage shopping or that is going to a high-end you know, designer a modern furniture designer. And that's all lifestyle attitude preferences. So I think it's very important to include, and most firms don't. We focus on the very basic demographics and that's where we're getting at our, um, our purchasing. Casinos is another great example here. Originally casinos mostly focused on the demographics and they you would think that the people that are the high rollers would be the ones that are spending the most amount of money. But it was actually for a lot of casinos, it's the locals, it's the people that are coming in for day trips. Um, and what they're looking for were different things and different attitudes than what say people that were traveling or the high rollers were looking at. And so a lot of casinos when they found this data actually shifted their strategies from focusing on the big high rollers to focusing the experience based on the psychographics of those individuals that were sort of coming in just for the day or for several hours. So I would absolutely add that in and it will make you, give you a competitive advantage because as I mentioned, most firms only collect basic demographic information. Excellent question. Perfect, thank you. Um, we have time for a few more questions. So um, here, here's another one. How do you most effectively structure a department for customer service and customer experience? And what are some structures that are efficient and effective to ensure alignment? What is, you know, is one department above the other or is it, you know, it all comes together? Yeah, I think that's a great question as well. Again, I, I would say get your 
your leadership team together and see what would work best, you know, brainstorm, see what would work best. I mean, you certainly could have, you want to identify key areas. It may be some type of hierarchical structure. It may be something where we identify more of our key employees across different departments might be the best way to do it. I think also, I love in your question that you use the word alignment because that's exactly what you're looking for is you want to make sure that across the different departments or across the different layers that there is that alignment in what we are looking for. What is that brand? Does leadership, does the C-suite the C -suite have that alignment? Do we have that in terms of the management? Do we have that in terms of the employees? Because when there's that misalignment, right, if the C-suite and the management are misaligned and management to employees are misaligned, then we're not delivering it. Because realistically, your C-suite is not having the most interactions with your customers. It's the line level employees. Training becomes something that's there and, and communication. And it's that daily interaction with management and employees. It isn't that once a year training seminar that we have, but it's identifying those coachable moments and those teachable moments that we have with our staff every day. You did a great job with this customer interaction. Let's talk about what happened here with this customer complaint. All of those things will lead to better alignment across the board. So hopefully that helps. Absolutely. Um, it feels good to hear all of this, especially you know, um, uh, related to the answer uh, for, on, on the previous question that that you've addressed. Um, what what is the ne what's next for those who already have the insight? What's the yeah, next I mean, step? Yeah, I think that I think that it's important. I I would specifically say that this is the time to revisit your customer experience strategy. Our customers are looking for very different things and as a result of what has happened over the last year and a half. So revisit what your customers are looking for, what's important, um, because what worked two and five years ago may need to be shifted a little bit. There may be some really big business opportunities that you are missing that your competitors are taking advantage of. So with that, I would revisit some of these things, revisit that journey that you have, make sure that you, is there different data that you should be collecting that will give you different insights so that your management can have different strategies. I think that's what I would really say. Take a look at that again, re-strategize. Um, and of course, if there are further questions or anyone wants to reach out to me, or anyone else from the Eisenberg School of Management in UMass, we are happy to assist you with this. We want all of you, you know, to be very successful. That's the goal here, because again, your competitors are taking advantage of these opportunities. And there are a lot of customers that are hungry for great business, hungry for great experiences, hungry for great service. So we are happy to assist you and want all of you to be very successful. It's been my pleasure to speak to all of the attendees today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Baker. This was really uh, a wonderful presentation. We really appreciate the opportunity to have you present for, for Ivy Exec audience. Um, it was very insightful. And I would also like to thank um, all of you for joining us today. We will definitely um, make sure to share the recording of the webinar in the coming days because almost everyone expressed interest in it, Dr. Baker. So this was really a, a wonderful presentation. Thank you again, and I wish you all um, a great rest of your day. Thank you.